So uh, one of the responsibilities that our young people here in Holy Family have is to periodically clean the house, uh, which is a wonderful job that they all look forward to doing, and they do with great gusto and enthusiasm under the surveillance of one of our uh, community members who makes sure that everything is done to a high standard. And one of the jobs that needed to be done there recently before uh, the uh, filming of, of life here was to clean the glass doors at the back of the chapel that you can't see. Uh, we clean the doors, clean all the, the glass panels in the doors around the place. And someone proceeded to do so with a cloth that had been used for cleaning out a frying pan or a dog's house or a Vaseline factory, I'm not quite sure. Either way, the cloth wasn't the cleanest. Now, that's all fine and dandy. In the evening, you wouldn't notice the difference, unless you have a keen eye, so it was noticed by some. Uh, but on a sunny day, that's when every little fingerprint, nose print, forehead print, stroke of the cloth could be seen with the greatest of detail. Uh, and it's amazing what light does. Light shows the truth of what's there. Whether we see it or not, whether we realize, realize it or not, light shows the truth. It's just, there it is. Now, in the darkness, you can't see it, you might be unaware of it, but as soon as the light comes out, everything is apparent. In the first reading of uh, the feast for today, um, we hear these beautiful lines from the first letter of St. John. If we say we are in union with God, while we are living in the darkness, we are lying, because we are not living in the truth. But if we live our lives in the light, as he is in the light, we are in union with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us all from sin. Okay, there's a lot going on there. Um, we've got St. John linking, living in the light, Truth and sin, okay? Three fantastic uh, themes, right? Living in, living in the light, uh, being in the truth, and the reality of sin. Now, uh, we, I heard someone say during the week that uh, somewhat traditionally in Ireland, we had an, a tendency to focus on the, the need for, for mercy, for you know, the, 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 the depravity of sin, probably a little bit of our, our Jansenist um, past. Uh, so like, to very much focus on, on our fallenness, our brokenness, our woundedness, our, the need for healing, uh, the, 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 the sin, the repentance, all this kind of thing. Kind of forgetting that while all that is true, at the same time we also have to hold on to the fact that we are redeemed that we are saved and that we are heaven bound with the help of God. You know, and that like the Lord has, the Lord is doing all of this to get us to heaven. And like the Lord has done everything that needs to be done on the cross. All we have to do is say, I accept. But like to, to live in this reality of, of Easter, right? The Lord has died and risen and set us free. And who the son sets free is free indeed, which means free in reality, free in truth okay so we, we we live in the light we want to live in the light now the advantage and disadvantage of living in the light is that it shows the truth that's an advantage and a disadvantage it's an advantage because it means that all, all of the good that's done is seen to be done and it's we can glorify god because of it you know when we live in the light we, we do what we do so that god may be praised but some people prefer the darkness as, as saint john tells us elsewhere because their deeds were evil. So that's the, the flip side of it, is that everything that we do is brought out into the light. Also the not so good stuff. And that's, that's, our, that's our, our, our task here on earth, to try and live a life that if people were to go through our lives and also our interior lives with a microscope, that they would discover the Lord, that they would discover efforts to, to overcome vice, and even Catherine of Siena, she, she struggled with, uh, with sexual temptation. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think it to, 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 to read her writings, but she did. Something that she struggled with. But struggling, struggling with the thing isn't, isn't the problem. The problem is if you don't struggle, <laughs> if you just give in. 
But she struggled, she fought, she, so she fought these things. So you can bring all these things out into the light, and we can read these, her writings now, about six centuries later, and say, yes, she struggled with these things, but my goodness, she, she, she did well, she won. So, like, that's, that's what it means, like, to, to have our lives brought out into the light. You think of Adam and Eve, even before, before the fall, as such, they lived so much in the light, they didn't even need clothes. Their intentions were so pure, and the way they looked at each other was so pure, that there was nothing to hide, there was no need to hide anything. Because they lived in God. They lived as saints. There was nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to be embarrassed about, nothing to be tempted by. All, all was good, all was pure. Just living in the light, living in the truth. You know? And the truth can be hard. The truth can be, can be, can be difficult for us. Something that we discover here in Holy Family on a regular basis, like trying to help people to come to terms with, with the truth of their lives and their pasts and their families and their fears and everything that's going on, to come to a recognition and a healing of the truth. Rather than trying to run away from it all the time or disguise it or distract ourselves or constantly kind of have your mind set on being somewhere else and then I'll be happy and if I'm married I'll be happy and if I live there I'll be happy and far away hills are always greener. Instead of saying, well here I am, right now this is me. Okay, there's a whole pile of mess right there. Okay, let's bring that out into the light. And kind of like a, a boogeyman under the bed, you turn on the light and he's suddenly gone. You bring the dirt out into the darkness and then it can be cleaned. It loses its power. You turn on the lights, the sun rises, and now we can see what needs to be cleaned. And then that takes, that takes the fear away. Because who's doing the cleaning? Our Father. He's got a whole host of helpers. Um, he sends his son. He sends his mom. Well, yeah, Jesus' mom. Uh, he sends the church, saints, our brothers and sisters around here, everyone, to help us, to bring us out into the light so that we don't have to be afraid anymore. St. Catherine of Siena was one of 25 children. I think we should canonize her mom, right? Okay, whoever she was. Anyway, one of 25 kids, fair play. Um, it's born at the end of the 14th century. And most of the children didn't get past infancy. I mean, poverty would have been a problem, hot, very high infant mortality rate. So like hard, hard life for, for the parents there. So she was a twin, her twin died. Uh, when she was 16, uh, her sister, Bonaventura, died, and her sister had been married. So then the parents thought it would be a great idea for her then to marry her brother-in-law, you know, to kind of substitute her sister, Bonaventura. Catherine thought not so positively of this proposal, and so proceeded to uh, fast an awful lot and cut off her hair and that sort of thing uh, in order to be less appealing to said suitor. Uh, so her parents, seeing her, her great efforts, uh, decided not to push the issue and let her live her life. Uh, she became a third order Dominican. So third order Dominican means you live at home. You're not, you're not, you don't live in the convent. You, just, you live the Dominican lifestyle or spirituality at home, which she did. So she served her family, served her, her, her community, uh, had a tendency to give away all sorts of things that weren't necessarily hers from the family and give away food and clothes and all sorts just to the poor just, just such a, a, a magnanimous heart you know such a, a, a wide soul uh, for the poor and for the needy that she, she would just give away so she was she was greatly loved greatly loved but she had a mystical experience I think she was 21 at the time where her love for the Lord was so intense and so real that she had what's called like a, a mystical espousal, mystical marriage with the Lord. Uh, a beautiful reality that's, that's kind of hard for maybe us to, 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 to get our heads around what it means to, to kind of marry the Lord. But, you know, we, if you read the, the Song of Songs, you know, this kind of idea of, of Jesus, the lover of my soul, uh, these, are, these are realities that, they're spiritual reality. They go way beyond our experience here of, of love or relationships it's, it's something so profound 
uh, but she lived it in, in, in this way, or the Lord expressed it to her in that way that as such he married her. Okay, so she was a, a lady then of, of profound knowledge of God. Uh, one could say gifted also with the, with the stigmata, so suffered quite a lot for the church, the church which had been um, going through great turmoil. Uh, the king of France managed to appoint a Frenchman to the seat of Peter, so a French man became Pope, uh, Clement V. And while Clement V was, was in Rome, he was surrounded by Italians who didn't like the fact that there was uh, a foreigner as such on the throne. And so Clement V said, right, that's it, I'm moving. So he moved the papacy to Avignon. And uh, seven popes, so six, him plus six popes after him, ruled the church from Avignon, right? So a big break with tradition because now you've got like the, like the Roman Catholic Church, but now the French, what, where, how? It's just a very, a time of great confusion. So this third order Dominican, a no one, a nobody, pleads with the Pope. I mean, sorry, who are you to plead with anyone? But she does. She has great spiritual authority, which doesn't come from the fact that she was, uh, I don't know, had, had great study or from a noble family, nothing rubbish like that came from the fact that she was deeply united with God and that's what gave her word weight. So she could actually converse with popes, the most powerful people on the planet, more or less, at the time. And she convinced the Pope then to come back to Rome. I mean, imagine writing to, the, to Pope Francis and trying to convince him to come to Ireland, even for a visit, never mind move house. You know, uh, <laughs> it's kind of unthinkable. But for, for a person of, of no great social status, absolutely unthinkable. But again, where does this power come from? Not from her, from her unity with God. She has profound writings in, in her, her dialogue, as it's called, and that's why she became recognized then as a doctor of the church for her spiritual writings. Her profound knowledge of the love of the Lord's heart and her profound meditation on his passion. So Lord, we remember today that we're called to live in the light, which means to live without fear, to live in the truth. And the truth is sometimes wonderful and the truth is sometimes challenging. But not living in the truth means living in the darkness, means running, means hiding, and it means constantly being afraid that one day the truth will be discovered. So Lord, help us to bring out into the light the truth of who we are, the truth of our sinfulness, it's called confession, the truth of our brokenness, the truth of our need for you, that we may also rejoice in the truth of our salvation, the truth of our healing, the truth of your forgiveness. Amen.